peacefully and legally. So that being said, uh, let's uh, turn it over to John and let's finish up his fine presentation that he gave with regard to this undisclosed, subliminal, latent pandemic with the Spanish flu that the government has not disclosed to us and which is going to rear its ugly head in the months and years ahead. And that which Dr. Fauci has covered up. So this is with regard to the indictment of Dr. Anthony Fauci. Thank you, Larry. So I thought I would wrap up the testimony with a summary, a recap, um, based on the last three testimonies that I gave to the grand jury. The data that you'll see today has been updated. So it represents the most recent uh, updates from the CDC. So in summary, the reason I was engaged in this in the first place is because of the map from Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> I, I didn't put any maps in this presentation. I think we showed you guys the maps before. Um, but the notion that today there still aren't 10 people dead in Beijing, there still aren't 10 people dead in Shanghai, uh, there's not 250 dead in Hong Kong, but it continues through Asia. It's not just China. It's Vietnam, it's Thailand, it's Laos, Cambodia, Mongolia, and Australia. We talked about how more people have fallen down in Australia and died than have died from coronavirus. So using statistics like that that were map-based, I started to dig in and what we found, you can go to the next slide, Jason. <clears throat> so what we found, uh, first of all, was something that was rather uh, remarkably strange, which was that Dr. Fauci at a Georgetown presentation for the Center for Global Health Science and Security, Dr. Fauci predicts that the incoming Trump administration is going to experience a surprise outbreak. Now, this prediction was made in January of 2017 before President Trump was sworn in. And Dr. Fauci says this incoming administration will most certainly experience a surprise outbreak. And that's on the next slide. So, Jason, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, there's a clip of Dr. Fauci saying this. And so that seemed rather strange that he was able to predict a surprise outbreak in 2017, this is January of 2017. So if we go to the next slide, what I spent the last three <clears throat> uh, testimonies sharing with the grand jury is that the data that I'm using for all these charts I'm showing you is coming directly from the CDC. So I go to the CDC's website and I download their data on a regular basis. And so the charts you're going to see now were updated June 24th, 2021. And this is the most recent official data from the National Center for Health Statistics at CDC. So the statistics <clears throat> that we pull away from their data that Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, Dr. Redfield, Francis Collins, that whole team have not disclosed to the public that seems to be relevant to the conversation. Number one, 80% of the people that died with SARS-CoV-2 were 65 and older. 80%. Now let's go to the next slide and I'll show you what that looks like. So on the left, you see a pie chart with the actual numbers. And then on the right, I asked it to show it as percentages. And what we're looking at is in the United States, people who died with SARS-CoV-2, this is all deaths with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. The actual numbers are on the left. The percentages are on the right. 80% of the people who died were 65 and older. Okay, let's go to the next slide. 
as of today, a year and a half into this pandemic, SARS-CoV-2 has killed less than 300 school-age children in the entire United States. Now, we're talking about kids that are uh, 5 to 18 years old here. Okay? More kids drown than have died from coronavirus. All right. 262, I think, is this might be last week's number. Yeah, this week, I think it's up uh, one or two. But the notion that less than 300 children have died, and yesterday and today, the CDC is having an emergency meeting to discuss issues with the heart. Jason, what's the name of that, uh, that affliction? Myocarditis and pericarditis, which as I understand it, is an inflammation of the sac around the heart, and it can be extremely dangerous, very rare in young, healthy people. <clears throat> so there was an emergency meeting yesterday at the CDC about myocarditis. The, the pericarditis came up in the meeting as well. But one of the things that did not come up in the meeting, let's go back, go back up to the, uh, the number of, of kids, less than 300. The thing that didn't come up in the meeting is that less than 300 children have died from the disease. So if less than 300 children have died from coronavirus, and I think now it's 263 or 265 or something, but it's less than 300. If less than 300 kids have died, why are we vaccinating all of the children? Because more kids drown than died from coronavirus. So does this constitute a medical emergency? Now, last year, 199 kids died from pediatric influenza. So how far away is that number? All right. The next issue <clears throat> that I didn't really talk about in the last three testimonies, but this came up because of yesterday's meeting at the CDC, this emergency meeting that was talking about these issues in the VAERS system. One of the issues that I'm not hearing brought up that needs to be discussed is that there are only 119 children in the United States that have died with SARS-CoV-2. This is all deaths with COVID. More than half of these kids also had influenza. We know that. But for newborns to four years old, there's 119 deaths. But the VAR system is showing us that for women who were pregnant who took the vaccine, we've had 692 miscarriages. So it, it, to me, when I look at the data this way, using actual facts, actual numbers, not superlatives, what I'm seeing is that the apparent remedy seems to be killing more newborns than the disease it's designed to prevent. That's what I take away from that. The VAERS system on the left is showing us how many people have miscarried. And I don't, I don't think I'm allowed to say women anymore, Larry. I think I have to say birthing persons. Or I get, I, I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get sued by CNBC if I say women. So birthing persons that have miscarried. Yeah. So Larry, yeah. get me out of this mess, please. Well, and and, and so, don't, don't say we're going to have fried chicken and watermelon for lunch either. At oh, Ikea. No, we're, we're definitely not shopping okay, at Ikea. I've had it with them. Yeah, they're, they're, they're definitely causing trouble. All right. So we've had fried chicken and watermelon. It's great. It's great summer treat. So for those of you who don't know, that was the Juneteenth celebration at Ikea that Larry is referencing. And well, yeah, let me back here. This, this is more than cancel culture. And that's what I was talking about with the District of Columbia Bar and the New York Bar. He said it's to remove anyone who will stand up to the tyranny of the left, which has taken total control of our country. That's what it's all about. Go ahead, John. Well, when we, when we look at these numbers side by side and we look at 692 miscarriages compared to the pie chart on the right, 
the pie chart on the right is how many little kids have died from the disease in the first place. Excuse me. So if there's 100, 119 kids that have died from coronavirus and close to 700 miscarriages, n- nobody thinks this is worth spending any time discussing, Dr. Fauci? Dr. Wolenski, this question. is... Yes. I have a question. Because it's my understanding that the VAERS system is a voluntary reporting system. So if we have 692 cases, it's possible there are additional miscarriages that never reported to this system because they did not make the connection. Yeah, that was acknowledged in the CDC meeting yesterday. So I, I watched, they broadcast it live, and I watched the CDC emergency meeting yesterday and recorded it. And one of the things that came up is exactly what you just said is that the system tends to be under reporting because it's voluntary and most people don't sit down and start creating a bears account. So yes, it's probably undercounted. And that was confirmed in the meeting at the CDC yesterday. The next element of what again appears to be <clears throat> this, this um, criminal negligence, SARS-CoV-2 has killed twice as many men as women in almost every single age group. And again, this came up in the emergency CDC meeting yesterday, but only when the evidence was presented that 75% of the, what's the name of the condition again? Um, I keep drawing a blank on it. Myocarditis Myocarditis and pericarditis. Myocarditis. So 75% of the myocarditis cases are male. Well, that sounds like a big deal until you go to the next slide and you realize, well, SARS-CoV-2 kills mostly men in the first place. So if it's killing mostly men in the first place, the fact that 75% of the myocarditis cases are also men, I don't find that so outlandish because I know this, but most people don't because Dr. Fauci kept this a secret. Now, why does Dr. Fauci not think this is important? This is a two to one ratio. Twice as many men in these age categories are dying as women. And I'm basing this on chromosomes, not um, sexual identification. So the chromosomes you were born with is what we're talking about here. And it's a two to one ratio. And Dr. Fauci didn't think this was relevant to the conversation. I find this very hard to comprehend why this would not be relevant. Let's go to the next slide, please. To the extent that the economy was shut down, that restaurants were shut down, that businesses were shut down, that uh, gymnasiums and uh, salons and all this was shut down, there aren't 17,500 people dead in the United States that are 45, that are younger than 45. 17,500, but there's not, there's not 17,500 people younger than 45 that have died with coronavirus in the United States. So yet we shut down the NCA, the colleges and all this other stuff. Now, back in 2017, 2018, 10,000 people died of influenza just in Texas, just in Texas, 10,000 people died of influenza in 2017, 2018. And the Dallas Cowboys kept playing football. All right. What you see here, younger than 45 is in blue and older than 45 is in green. Does it appear kind of clear where the problem lies? And why did we shut down the NCAA? Why did we torture high school kids? Well, are you 45. Are go, you ahead, suggesting, go ahead, Larry. Are you suggesting that Dr. Fauci, by withholding information, is intentionally trying to harm the people of the United States? The evidence is so overwhelming. There's so much evidence, Larry, 
of lies of omission. Again, it, it's not like it's one development here. If it was one single development, maybe there'd be some plausible deniability. You know, but we had four. Let me, let me interject this too, and I'm not to interrupt, but so the thought gets out there is that a violation under man made law, 18 USC 1001, is for making a false statement to the government. It's not just making a false statement, but omitting material facts. For that, you can get 10 years in prison if you make a statement which is false or omits material facts in a government filing for that act. Under the laws of nature and nature's God, see, this is where we differ, okay? We're not necessarily bound by that which our corrupt Congress has enacted. But if the government does the same thing to the people, if they either give them false facts or withhold material information that bears on their health, safety, and welfare, then they should be held criminally liable as well. So this will be included in the indictment against Fauci because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's time the American people held government officials to the same standard that the American people are held to. Go ahead. So Larry, I think, you know, at minimum, at minimum, we would be looking at criminal negligence. And I'm, you know, you, you would know the formal definition, but at minimum, the amount of evidence I'm seeing here that's been just completely not shared with the public. If it's not criminal negligence, then my understanding of criminal negligence is all wrong. But my understanding of criminal negligence is that I think he, you know, this and, adds up to it. And negligent homicide, like I said in an earlier session, exactly. this is our 14th session. This is and Derek the Bell is going to get life negli- for what happened with with uh, George Floyd, and that was neg- negligent homicide. That's exactly what Fauci has done with the American people. The reason it's so important for the grand jury to understand the role that the influenza played in the pandemic is that the influenza has FDA approved therapeutics, whereas coronavirus, the only FDA approved therapeutic is remdesivir and the WHO does not recommend it. So there's no oral uh, therapeutics for coronavirus but there are for influenza. And so if we had 600,000 people or so die, and it turned out that more than half of them had the influenza and they weren't given the therapeutics, I think exactly, Larry, that has to be negligent homicide. How is it not? If you've got a patient in a bed with influenza that you don't diagnose and they die, and you had a therapeutic like a Zofluza or a romantidine, there's a whole number of them that potentially could have treated it. How is that not negligent homicide? So again, I'm, I'm not the law guy. I'm the numbers guy. But what I can tell you as a matter of fact, in the United States for the past three months, according to the CDC's mortality data, more people have died from PNI, which is pneumonia and influenza, which is what Dr. Fauci talks about when he says 2017, 80,000 people died. More people have died from PNI in the last three months than COVID every single week for the last three months. Not just total, every single week. More people died from influenza PNI than from COVID. And the data is coming right from their system at the NIH. Next slide, Jason, you'll see the data. So this is 13 weeks of data. Since week 10 in the United States, 57,900, I can't read it, Jason, maybe you can read it, 57,998 have yeah. died from PNI. So 57,998 have died from influenza, while 49,618 have died from COVID since week 10. 
Now, if you zoom out and you look at it, what you'll see is the influenza is blue, the COVID is green. And every single week for the last three months in the United States, more people have died from PNI than have died with COVID. But Dr. Fauci hasn't said anything, and there are therapeutics for influenza besides Tamiflu. Tamiflu is old. We have Zofluza, we have Romantadine. There's a number of therapeutics that are approved. John, I don't, don't know if you've heard this. I don't know yeah. if you've heard this latest news. You and I have spoken quite a bit about YouTube's rules against their allegations of vaccine misinformation. They've changed that rule now to treatment misinformation. Well, it's I think they part and parcel they, to what we're talking about, which is a total leftist takeover. Every aspect of government, the federal courts in particular, the social media. <laughs> well, that takes us. Corporate yeah, that takes us. Labor unions, intelligentsia, universities. We now live in the equivalent of the Fourth Reich, and this is what we're dealing with. So, yeah, of course they've lowered the threshold here because they've got to squash it out. And when you see a judge like Ross, Ross, uh, Royce Lambert, you know, cave in to the left. Uh, you know, it tells you where we are today is that they've got control of everybody. Uh, they have total domination and people are scared and they don't want to speak out and they don't want to act. And that's what we're trying to do peacefully and legally with our citizens grand juries and also with our third continental Congress and everything else that uh, we're doing at Freedom Watch and, and in other endeavors. So that's what it's about. And then you've got the New York Bar and the District of Columbia Bar disciplinary apparatus trying to eliminate conservative lawyers who will stand up to them. And you have a total takeover of the country. And you don't have to do it with red coats and, and muskets. You can do it, you know, by just intimidating people to follow like sheep the leftist total takeover of this country. Well, the good news is there is a law when it comes to emergency use authorization. And that law is U.S. Code Title 21. <clears throat> and it appears that the FDA may have broken the law when they issued the emergency use authorization because we already had an approved therapeutic in remdesivir. And according to the law, you're not supposed to issue an emergency use authorization if there's already an alternative treatment. Now, it's different when we're talking about diagnostics. The diagnosing and the diagnostic equipment is different than the treating and the prevention. <clears throat> so when you see the law, you start to understand, oh, so the emergency use authorization for the vaccines to Pfizer, Moderna, J&J, would never have been granted if, in fact, a therapeutic had been found to be effective. But one was, which is remdesivir, and it was approved. So once remdesivir was approved, you're not supposed to grant an EUA oh, on and something. And you raise the point, John, there is no law, okay? We live in a lawless society. It doesn't matter what the law is, and that's why that we since grand juries, we have to enforce the laws of nature and nature is God. And that's what we're doing. So thank you for that. Let's move on. Let's, you know, if you want to sum it up real quickly, because we want to spend the next uh, 25 minutes on our, our, on Ilham Omar. And uh, we have more. All right, so let me wrap it up. Yep. Let me wrap it up. So the, the net of the testimony, let's go back up one or two slides, Jason. The net of the testimony that I showed you uh, yeah, you can stop there. That's a good one. Um, is that we were experiencing an outbreak in the United States of influenza in January, February, March of 2020 that was unprecedented. 4,000 people a week were dying. And what we looked at in previous testimony was, well, did that just disappear? Or what happened for real? What actually happened? The data that I've shown the grand jury over the course of the last three and a half testimonies would indicate that the United States and maybe the rest of the world has just experienced the worst influenza outbreak since 1918. 
Now, was this a gain of function virus that would point back to Dr. Fauci, to Dr. Kawaoka, to Dr. Taubenberger? I can't be certain, but the behavior of Dr. Fauci not wanting to address the fact that there's two out, you know, why would that be such a secret that there's two outbreaks? We've talked about this in previous testimony. So if in fact it had been this strain from Taubenberger or from Kawaoka that was easily identifiable that Dr. Judy Mikovits testified, she said, yeah, you know, it's like a non-issue, right? So if it's easily identifiable and traces back to Walter Reed or Fort Detrick, well, then the whole world would want to come and visit the United States labs instead of Wuhan. Well, in addition to Wuhan. Well, Wuhan is all about coronavirus, and coronavirus hasn't killed 10 people in Beijing or Shanghai. So that's why. For one, it's too many. Well, of course, but 10 people in Beijing, 10 people in Shanghai aren't dead yet. And we don't have a hundred and we don't have a hundred dead in Vietnam. So what that simply introduces is, well, wait a second, how deadly is it compared to the influenza pandemic we just experienced? And if it turns out that, well, the SARS thing is not a good thing, you know, you, nobody wants to get SARS-CoV-2, but forget it. This, this influenza is incredibly dangerous. And that appears to be what happened based on the data. Well, and that's enough to seek an indictment. As I said at the outset, when we gave the instructions, you can indict much less than probable cause and mere suspicion. So that will come out in the subsequent trial, Dr. Fauci. You've done excellent work, John. Thank you.